fact is too precious to tell any fool who asks for it. That's one of my favorite quotes, and it's unfortunately very true as well, especially in this digital world with more than half of the world online. Just recently, millions of people signed up for the Face app so that they could follow the trend and post a picture of themselves looking very aged. It was then broadcast that Face app revealed huge holes in their privacy laws, and that created a big uproar. So user trust has never mattered more now than ever before. And to discuss the opportunities and challenges of a privacy-first web for business and for advertising, I would like to now welcome to the stage Google's Matt Britton, everyone. Matt Britton. Um, I'm actually much younger than this, but I've used the Face app this morning to make myself look a bit older. Um, I've also always wanted to be a newsreader. And um, so what I thought I'd do is turn this next session over. Welcome to the three-hour special on Brexit and what's been happening in the UK Parliament. Maybe not. No, no. <laughs> no don't applaud that, please. Um, actually, of course, what I'm going to talk about is making the web work for everyone in a privacy-first world. I'm going to attempt, during the course of this talk, a world first. I'm going to attempt a live human demonstration of differential privacy. And to check that you're warmed up for that, so I need you to participate a little bit. So can I just check uh, that you're all here? If you're here, could you just put your hand up and say yes? yes? Excellent. Thank you very much. A couple more questions. Has anybody this morning used this, the World Wide Web? Anyone used the web this morning? 30 years old this year, 30 years old. I want to put what I'm saying in the context of the big picture. Also, has anybody here used this this morning? Say yes. Quite a few of you. So this is Google, which was founded 21 years ago this year. And we take these things for granted. We're the people who've got used to these technologies. We're doing these things hundreds of times a day, and we barely even notice them. But as you just heard, we reached this year the 50-50 moment. For the first time, half the population on the planet is online. All the world's information, all the world's computing power, all the people on the planet, all of the ideas are in the palm of your hand. And we all know how transformational and wonderful that is. 3.9 billion people, 3.9 billion people still to come online. And when Tim Berners-Lee with the Web Foundation celebrated 30 years of the web. Like the true engineer he is, he didn't spend a lot of time on what's wonderful. We all know that. He spent time thinking about what do we need to do together to ensure that the web remains open and affordable for everyone. And the Web Foundation developed a contract for the web. Google's one of the first companies to sign up for the contract for the web. And it's about how we together have responsibilities and opportunities to keep the web open and affordable for everyone. Responsibilities for governments, responsibilities for companies, and responsibilities for individuals. And in the area of companies, the three big things which we sign up to are firstly, to protect personal data and privacy for everyone. The second thing is to ensure that the web is affordable and open for everyone. And the third thing is that we all together develop technologies that bring out the best in humanity while challenging the worst. Those are important and ambitious things that we sign up to publicly, uh, and I hope that the rest of us together can come together around this. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about how privacy and personalization are not at odds, but how privacy and personalization are essential and at the heart of sustaining the open web and the ecosystem that has given all of us these benefits. So as somebody once said, there are three people in this marriage, users, advertisers, and publishers. And by publishers, I mean creators of all the content that we see online, whether it's journalism or music videos or apps, all of the things which we enjoy every day. And if you think about it, almost everything we use online is wholly or partly funded by advertising. So those three groups need to be in balance. And for each of them, there's a critical concern. So for users, 
They're concerned about privacy. They want to know their data is safe. They want to have control of that. They want to have choice over what's going on. They're also concerned about security, about malware. They're concerned about whether they consume content that's actually true rather than fake. A lot of concerns on the user front. The user has to come first. From an advertiser perspective, of course they want to ensure that they have effectiveness. They want to have control. They want to have transparency. They want to know they're buying what they think they're buying. They want to be able to measure and optimize. And ultimately, they want to build relationships of trust over time with users. And then for publishers and content creators, they need to be able to make sure that they can also build a relationship of trust over time, but that they can earn a return. They can make money and that we can fund quality content on the web. So I'm going to talk about each of those three. And for all three, for all three, privacy and personalization are critical. And we can have those two together. You have to start with the user, because what matters to the user matters to all of us. What matters to the user matters to all of us. At Google, we were founded with this notion. We were built on the open web. Search is all about helping you get from our site to something that you want to consume or engage with as quickly as possible. It all starts with the user for us. And there are two principles that we've always held dear, uh, and they are that the user should be informed and in control. Those principles are really important to us. And we built our business and our relationships with users on those principles. And actually, Europe has also been at the forefront of enforcing those principles as governments have moved to ensure regulation protects users online. Fundamentally important. E-privacy, GDPR, we're very supportive of both. They're built on the same principles as we believe in. And now we see other countries, Brazil, India, the Californians even, starting to move forward with regulation. But Europe's in the lead here, and those of us who are based in Europe have an opportunity as a result uh, of that. So users want to know who's collecting their data, how is their data being used, and they want to have a choice over the information that they share. Now, earlier this year, we opened our Google Safety Engineering Center right here in Germany, in Munich. And for many years, our team, our engineering team in Germany had been building privacy controls for Google users. We want to set the bar on privacy and security as high as possible. And understandably, Europeans, and particularly Germans, have a very high bar here. So uh, this year, by launching this center, this is building privacy and security into all our products. We have privacy and security built by Germans, made for everyone. Really important. And by the end of the year, we will have doubled the size of our team working on this. We'll have about 1,000 people uh, in Munich doing this stuff. So it's really important for us to do that uh, globally. Now, you can't have privacy if your data is not safe and secure. If somebody can get access to your data, that's not private. So it all starts with a foundational level. Be clear that there are two types of data here. There's your private data, your emails, your files, your photos, under lock and key, not for anybody unless you choose to share it with them. That's absolutely sacrosanct. But then there's also your digital footprint, the trace that you leave behind when you move across the web. And that's where we need, we need also to provide uh, transparency and control uh, for users. At Google, we never sell your data. We never sell your data. And we only use a fraction of data in advertising personalization. And we are working hard with the industry to find ways to do more with less data. Here's an example of something built by our team in Munich. This is within the Google account. Now, 20 million times a day, 20 million times a day, people come to the Google accounts so that they can be informed and in control of their settings across all of the Google products that they might choose to use. One of the sections is ad settings. 30,000 times an hour, 30,000 times an hour, people visit ad settings. And what they can do there is they can turn on or off all personalized advertising right at the top with a single switch. They can look at the categories of advertising and choose which categories they might see. Uh, and they can choose advertising from particular providers. And what we see is that the vast majority of people are happy with personalized advertising. And they like to be informed and in control. Very, very few are opting out. Just to give you an example of how this is all about your data and your choice, imagine you've been watching football highlights on YouTube, or you've been searching for football pitches near you. Then you decide, actually, I don't want to see advertising related to football. Well, you can go to ad settings and opt out of that category. 
or you can opt out of all personalized ads, or you can decide actually you want to see more on that topic and ad. So there's real control for users there. Now, it's great to have a destination like Google Accounts. 2.6 billion visits in a year to the Google account. But actually, that's not good enough. It's great to have a destination where you're in control, but sometimes you want the control to be where you are, in the app that you're in. That might be Search or Maps or even Android. And in all three, over recent months, we've introduced controls right there in the app. So for example, you can go into incognito mode, or you can choose to auto-delete your data. So in Search, you can choose three months or 18 months um, prior to uh, auto-deletion occurring, for example. So those are ways in which we continue to bring forward new features. And in fact, Android 10 launched uh, just last week. Android 10 has over 50 features and refinements around privacy and control. One example is location. You know that sharing your location on the phone is really helpful to get relevant and useful information, but you might not want to share your information with every single app. So what Android 10 allows you to do is for every app, to decide, do I want to share my location data always, never, or just when the app is open? And it can give you notifications to tell you what's going on. So that's one of the ways in which we're constantly looking at bringing this forward in our products. But let's talk more about the industry and how we can work together uh, in this field. So uh, no one company can do enough here. As I've tried to illustrate, this is something which the industry needs to, uh, to work together on. A lot of the headlines are about cookies and cookies going away. And what I'd say is that cookies are not the same as privacy. They're just a tool, and the tool can be useful. Um, one of the challenges with a singular focus on reducing cookies is what do people do to target when there aren't cookies? And device fingerprinting is on the rise as a result of that. Device fingerprinting means that a device is targeted individually. And that's a step backwards, because then the user is neither informed nor in control. So we need to find better solutions than that that help people to achieve the benefits of personalized advertising with higher standards uh, on privacy. So our Chrome team is instrumental here. Earlier this year, they introduced more controls into Chrome to restrict device fingerprinting, to give users more control over third-party cookies. We built new tools that give users more insight into the data that's used to personalize advertising and the companies involved in that. And we've also um, brought together all of the browser manufacturers to look at ways in which together we might make progress uh, on this area, which is so important for the future of the web and all of the services that we enjoy uh, every day. What if you could do more for the user with less data? We really believe that this is possible. Let me give you an example from a different area. Google Translate. If you've been using Google Translate, and many, many people do, you might have noticed that it's got significantly better in the last couple of years. That's thanks to machine learning and our ability, as a result of machine learning, to do more for the user with less data. We can now identify more accurate, accurately from your voice with fewer data points what you're saying. Fewer data points means less processing power on the device, means less data cost for the user, and yet more accurate results. That's one of the things which we've done with Translate, hugely beneficial to lots of people. So we want to bring, bring that kind of approach to advertising. So what if you could only advertise to somebody with a particular interest once you knew they were part of a group that had thousands of members? That would be a way of protecting privacy. What if no individually identifiable information left the browser? Well, that's what differential privacy and federated learning is all about. That's just one technique, but I'm just going to illustrate that technique. So here's the live demo. Can I just ask, raise your hand and say yes if you're a fan of the 56-year-old sci-fi TV series Doctor Who. Anyone? Yes, about 40 people probably. <laughs> Anybody in the room a fan of the sport of rowing or rudern for my Deutsche Freunde? Uh, two. Three, it's about 10, 10 tall, mainly tall men. Uh, anybody in both of those groups? <laughs> Hello, my friend. So two of us. So what if we were not targeted with personalized advertising until we knew that there were thousands of us, not two of us? That's one of the ways that this technique works. I'm really excited that we've open sourced this approach. And it's useful not just for the advertising industry. It's useful for all kinds of people who are interested in looking at 
citizens' data as a way to try and improve things. So cities and healthcare and hospitals and governments. It's a really interesting new field and one which we think can bring real benefits. So thank you for being part of my live demo. And I'll come and see my friends later. Um, now, the third person in this marriage is the publisher, the content creator. And we have to really work hard to ensure that they can earn a return on um, their efforts. And we've done a study which we've published both the methodology and the results. It's the biggest randomized control experiment where we looked at serving personalized advertising and non-personalized advertising. What's the difference in monetization? And what we found was that uh, you only get about 52% of the monetization when advertising is less personalized. This is across all kinds of categories of players and geographies. And actually, it's even worse if you're in the news industry. It's more like 60% reduction in monetization. So that's a real concern. So how do we work on this? Well, at Google, with AdSense, we've got the biggest way of helping people monetize their content and their apps. Uh, we share the majority of revenue with the content owners, as you know. But the first thing we have to do is try to make sure that bad actors don't have an economic incentive to publish fake news and poor quality content. Um, and so with AdSense, we've reviewed and raised the bar on our misrepresentation policies uh, and our enforcement of that, which means that last year we removed 734,000 publishers and app developers for that, from that program so that we're stopping people having an economic incentive to be spammy and faking and fraudulent. But that's not enough. Of course, what you really need is that quality content can be found and thrive and make money. So uh, let's take the example of news publishing. 10 billion times a month, 10 billion times a month, people come to Google and ask us about news stories and topics. And 10 billion times a month, we send them through to one of 80,000 news publishers. These are all organizations that employ journalists. They are who they say they are. There's a huge array of political um, leanings within there, but they're all genuine news publishers. That's a huge volume of traffic estimated by independent research by Deloitte in Europe to be worth between five and 10 cents a click in terms of people coming through to the publisher websites. So that's one way, helping quality content be found and fighting fakery. Of course, you need to try to monetize that quality content. And our program paid out over $14 billion last year to publishers to help them uh, make money online. So those are some of the things that we're doing uh, to help there. Now, um, we need to talk about the third party in here, which is advertisers. How can we help advertisers to operate with personalization uh, in a privacy-first world? Well, first-party relationships are absolutely vital here, and lots of advertisers are focused on this. But I think also, as I've tried to illustrate, machine learning can bring you the advantage of scale while respecting privacy. And rather than me tell you uh, more about this, I thought what I'd do is actually invite a genuine expert to our stage. She very rarely speaks uh, in public, but I'm delighted to welcome Emily Henderson, our head of media. Welcome to the stage, Emily. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Matt. It's great to be here. I'm thrilled to be here at New Mexico seeing you all today. As Matt said, my name is Emily, and I manage a team called the Media Lab at Google. We're a team within Google Marketing that leads all of Google's media strategy, planning, buying, execution, and measurement for our own advertising campaigns. So that's campaigns we run for products like Pixel, um, campaigns for B2B products like SMB, as well as apps like Maps and Search. The key message that I'm going to talk about today is that effective advertising and user privacy go hand in hand. I'll show two examples of how we're doing that at Google. Now, before I get into the examples, it's worth saying that all of the things that I'm going to show today are based on off-the-shelf technology, technology that already exists. It's not something that we built specifically for us as Google. It's technology like Google Marketing Platform, Ads Data Hub, as well as the Google Cloud suite of tools and services. I'm excited to take you through them. We also partnered, it's worth mentioning, with our digital agency, Essence. I think some of you guys are in the audience today. And I want to give them a shout out for being a great partner and bringing these cases to life. So I'll talk a little bit about the way that technology is enabling us to be more effective while respecting user privacy. There's new technology like machine learning, as Matt mentioned, that's enabling us to do this better. We are working in this space on a couple of different things. So one of the areas is Google Ads. Google Ads for us is a business where we need to bring lots of different data together from different sources. 
Many of, the, of you in the audience probably are facing the same challenges as marketers, where you have data coming from CRM systems, data coming from online transactions, as well as data that's coming from offline sales and stores. And so we are working to bring machine learning models, so models using Google Cloud TensorFlow, to Google Ads, which is one of our products where the goal for Google Ads is a long-term revenue goal. So it's a goal that can't be tied to an action that's a simple action to measure online. By building these models, we're able to bring machine learning into our optimization process for Google Ads. And when we do that, we're able to bring that into the campaign using Google Marketing Platform and then set that live so it can optimize for the first time for us to our real-time business goal. So we've run, this, we've run some tests, rolling it out across Google Ads, and what we're seeing is an initial look at a 220% increase in return on ad spend. This was just an initial pilot that we ran, but we were really excited about this because this shows the potential of those models to bring this to life. And it's important to note that this was done using our global site tagging, which aggregated our data in a central place. And then we used Ads Data Hub to analyze and aggregate that data into a way that we as marketers can bring um, actionable insights out of that data. That's crucial because it respects the user's privacy through that process, Ads Data Hub being a secure place to hold data. Um, and we're able to then plug that into the campaign. So we're really excited about this result. We think that this is something that other advertisers can replicate and excited to share this with you guys today. Next up, I'll talk about contextual advertising. So we know that privacy is a personal choice. Users might elect to share more or less data, depending on their personal preferences. Yet we know as marketers, being relevant is key to being effective. Matt mentioned the stat from the publisher side, um, where we're seeing vast gains when we can deliver relevant ads. And publishers are seeing those gains as well. And so contextual advertising is something that we commonly deploy across many of our campaigns. You might have seen this campaign um, that we ran in Germany, and we've run in many other markets around the globe, where we were demonstrating ways to use Google Search in helpful contextual moments, so in out of home and digital ads, among other channels. Now, this is great, but contextual advertising can only be so relevant and so personal without the use of personal data. We want to be able to scale this and bring this to life, regardless of how much data a user chooses to share. That's their choice. So we thought, could we design an ad, a way to deliver ads, that feels personal without the use of any personal data whatsoever? To do this, we worked with one of our long-standing partners, The Guardian. The Guardian has an amazing array of content on their website and on their app content like recipes, and we know that cooking is one of the key use cases for Google Home. The ability to ask your Google Home when you're in the kitchen, your hands are covered in flour, to tell you the next step in the recipe or other actions. And so we thought, could we design a model that would bring contextual ads into those recipes? We took a TensorFlow model, again, Google Cloud technology, and working with The Guardian, we connected this with a dynamic display unit. And so that model could help us understand the complex nuance of each recipe. For the first time, we could understand if the recipe was something you would eat for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Um, we could understand the uh, specific ingredients within the recipe that you might need to pick up from the store on the way home. And we could also understand if the recipe had an extremely long cooking time that might cause you to get frustrated as a would-be chef. So once we connected this with this display unit, we were able to serve ads using this model through Google Marketing Platform. Those ads could do things like pull the specific ingredients within the recipe into the ad unit and show how a user could ask Google Home to add those recipes to their shopping list. We could also do things in a bit of a clever way. In the example of the recipe that takes three hours or longer to cook, we could show how you can ask Google Home to order you a takeaway instead of cooking dinner that night. We love this example because it feels personal. It's very contextual. It's more contextual than we've ever been able to be, to, to be before in an ad unit. And yet it uses no personal data whatsoever. Personalization without personal data. 
So that's it for me. I hope that these two examples have given you some concrete ideas about ways that marketers can create advertising that's better for all of us. It's more relevant, more effective, and more user safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, in summary, the open web that's affordable for everyone is something that's really worth us doubling down on together. We believe that you can have both privacy that's stronger and personalization that works better in these ways that we've described and some of the examples that we've given uh, to you here. And ultimately, it's not just for us who use these products every day. We can do more with less data for the next 3.9 billion users who get online and enjoy the web 30 years since it was invented. Uh, we really invite the industry to come together and work with us. I hope you've shown, we've shown you some of the ways we think about this, some of the ways we've launched tools in TensorFlow and technologies, and also trying to welcome the industry together to solve this together. No one company can do it on, a, on their own, and it's up to all of us uh, to make this work for everyone, including the next 3.9 billion. Thank you. Thank you very much to Google for this keynote speech just now. We're going to be back in a few minutes searching for the truth as we revisit our theme for this year's DMXCO with the co-founder of Wikipedia, Jimmy Wales. See you then.